Hello, everyone. Welcome back for a brand new episode of Collateral Ladies Night Pre-Party. I love the boys. And I'm so, so excited to get to talk about this show and then some with star Claudia Dumit. Hello. Congratulations. You are crushing it in season three. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Hello. I'm so happy to be here. This is great. This is amazing. I, I mean, can't wait. I mean it. It's not easy to play a character who is busy showing off one specific thing, but deep down is, you know, kind of manipulative and has different intentions than we are fully aware of just now. So I'm very yeah. impressed. Um, it does feel like I'm playing uh, seven different characters sometimes because Newman is a very mani manipulative character. She's very duplicitous. So uh, she definitely is a woman of many masks and she adjusts the mask that she wears based on the interaction she's having. So like whenever I get a script, I'm, I'm, I'm endlessly excited to see who she's interacting with because I'm like, oh, who is she today? Who is she in this episode? Who is she in this scene? So it's really... Uh, entertaining. Oh, I have many questions about that. But first, we have to know about how your journey in this industry began. And every episode of Collider Ladies Night starts here. What is the movie, the show, personal experience, whatever it may be that first made you say to yourself, I absolutely have to be an actor and nothing else? Oh, God. I was one of those annoying little kids, though, that like always wanted to act and always like wanted to be on, you know, a stage or a platform just craving my parents' attention. Um, so I knew that I wanted to to perform from a pretty young age. Um, I remember every afternoon I'd come home from school. I think I was about five or six at the time. I'd put on my mum's go-go boots and one of my dresses and like a bit of her lipstick. And we had these like huge speakers and I'd bring the speakers out to the balcony and blast Abba's Mamma Mia and perform it for my mum on the balcony every day. God bless her. The neighbours absolutely hated me. But um, but here I am. So it all worked out. This all makes so much sense. It began with ABBA and now we're at the boys. I see the connection there. Full circle. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, so you have, you have those early dreams to become an actor and ultimately you decided to study your craft in school. And that's yeah. something that I always love digging into because it's important for some people. Some people would rather just jump right into the industry and get professional experience. So at that point, why was it important for you to study your craft in that formal setting? Really, it was just kind of circumstance, actually. I, uh, when I was 17, I, I graduated high school and I auditioned for all the big acting schools in Australia. And I got rejected from every single one of them. And 17-year-old me was absolutely devastated at the time. Uh, and I remember my parents saying, you know, the, the old thing, they're like, you, well, you got to get an education of some kind. You have to get some education. So I, I went to like one of the universities and I dicked around in an arts degree for a semester and a half. And then I dropped out, didn't tell my parents and started taking acting classes on the side. And then I remember my mom said to me one day, your schedule's a bit off. <laughs> And uh, that's when I told her, I was, I was like, I'm acting, I've dropped out of, of, of university, um, I, I want to be an actor. And she did the best thing a parent could do in that situation. She was, I mean, she had like a, a moment of a breakdown and then she, she was really supportive and she said to me, okay, if you want to be serious about acting, let's be serious about acting. Talk to every person you know, every person you respect in the industry, like teachers, mentors, everything. Um, and ask their advice. And I did. I knew like five or six people that I really looked up to at the time. And I had calls with all of them and I asked them, what should I do? And every single one of them told me to leave Australia. They said, you're not going to work here. You're never going to work here. The industry, your face, your look doesn't sell. Uh, they said, go somewhere where there's more opportunity. Um, go to, go to London, go to Los Angeles, go to New York, anywhere you can get your foot in the door. And at the time, my mom had met a woman who was a manager in, uh, in Los Angeles. And she met her, she actually met her a few years prior at a function or something. And, and, um, and I didn't know this, but she'd been sending her what I'd been doing over the years. So if I did a, a, a production of like Julius Caesar, she'd email her and she'd say, my daughter's Brutus in Julius Caesar in this <laughs> local production. Um, which is mortifying. Thank God I didn't know any of that. But she was very much, uh, 
letting this woman know my journey with acting like over the years. And so I set up a, an appointment with her. When we, we came to LA and we set up a meeting and it went really well. And she said, I love your energy. Come back with a, with a, what did she say? She said, come back with a visa and an accent and I'd love to represent you. And I was like, great, I'll be back in a month. <laughs> Um, a year later I came back with a half-baked accent and like a student visa because I, I got into this this acting school, this acting conservatory, um, right on the intersection of Hollywood and Highland. <laughs> Hilarious. This um, was Stella Adler. Stella Adler. A okay. brilliant school, but like that, but also that was just my first introduction to what Los Angeles was. So I thought Los Angeles was the intersection of Hollywood and Highland when I first got here. <laughs> well. I kind of get it. <laughs> which is, yeah, which is like, it's just like such an extreme um, environment to be thrust into, but kind of necessary. And then that was just, and that's, that's how I started here. I, I, and then that manager like kind of cultivated my, you know, my career. And she was like, I'm going to send you out on a few things. And so it was really just opportunity. Um, I was told to leave my country um, if I wanted to get the opportunity that I wanted. And this is where this is just how it worked out. LA was just the place. I have to backtrack to something you said earlier in that you were told that your look wouldn't sell. Yeah. Is so were they saying it was a you problem in Australia or more or less opportunity in Australia? What what was that comment? Um, it was it was it was a it was a look thing. And granted, this is like twelve years ago at this point. So you know, it wasn't really the most diverse landscape and it's still getting to that, you know, we're still trying to get to that point really of like accurate representation of what people look like out in the world. Um, but yeah, just nobody, nobody looked like me on TV at the time. And, 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 you know, things are changing now and that's, that's amazing and so well overdue. Um, but yeah, there, there were just more opportunities for me to be in things out here. And so that's really what, what advice anyone could offer me at the time. It was soul crushing. I was like, it was, I was 17 at the time. And I was, I was like, no, they don't want me on TV. <laughs> My dream. Um, but it was the best piece of advice I could have got. And it sounds like you had someone really special in your corner when you got here with this agent. And I love talking about the actor agent relationships because it's so important and we don't yeah. talk about it nearly enough. So what is it that you appreciate in that relationship where, you know, even after some of that rejection, it still gives you the confidence that like I'm here and not only am I here, but my dream is realistic here. I mean, I think you just have to have someone who's in who's who was essentially that who's in your corner and like isn't just there for the, the paycheck or this or that, but like actually uh, is just with you as a friend and a person along the way and 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 kind of has an idea of you know, what the trajectory looks like. I think that's, it's just someone who's really invested in, in you and believes in you really. Um, uh, and, and that's, I, I, I have to have a relationship with my, with anyone on my team. Um, I, I can't operate any other way. So authenticity is the name of the game. I know it's different for everyone out there, but whenever I think of like actor, agent, manager relationships, I always think that it does have to have that friendship layer because it's not, I don't know, it, again, this is just my perception of it, but it's not just the career you do for work. It's because it's your deepest passion ever and yeah. who cares about your deepest passion more than someone you can call a true friend. Yeah. I mean, and they, yeah, they know your hopes and your dreams. They like, they, they, they're so deeply connected to, to your world and your wants and your desires and what you see for yourself and it, it has to be a friend it has to be someone who's like with you till the end I was gonna say Thelma and, Thelma and Louise but uh that's not a great ending so um you know <laughs> funny reference I think you're the next episode after Gina Davis is on there the show go. so I feel like that reference was meant to be <laughs> all right no. so let's get into some of your earliest tv experiences because you made a whole bunch of guest appearances before you booked a series regular role so of all of those early guest appearances which one would you say made the biggest impression on you where you found that particular experience coming in handy the most when you hit that first set as a series regular Oof. Um, I would say when I worked on Scandal, it was such a beast of a show and it was just such a moving machine. And I, I mean, I was like Bambi in the, like in the woods. I was so very lost, but, um, it, you really got an insight into like how the machine works and, and, um, 
and how much stuff they get in a day and how many bodies are you like how many people are used on a, on a project and and it, it was just it was insane to be in that environment cuz like the, the thing before that that you the th- the the only thing i'd been exposed to before that really is like a small student film or like you're in a theater production at school like it's not it's a whole nother world and you have to kind of adjust your lens to that world and that was my first big dose of that was scandal was being on scandal and i only had one line it was so funny <laughs> do you remember the line you totally remember the line. no i don't oh. <laughs> I think one of the episodes, well, I, I do, I do. Okay. I, I think like one of it was like, they need to see you. And then another one was just me saying the character's name, uh, Abby. I was like, Abby, that was it. That was it. So I was in my trailer for hours just practicing like Abby, Abby, <laughs> Abby. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. It's important that you did that because there's no small roles. If someone no. doesn't deliver the line, Abby, authentically, it takes a viewer out of the show. It does. Every job matters. Every job matters as an actor and every job is a win, honestly. It's, it's, you have to remember that. It's so important. And it was a great experience. It was great. All right, let's let's move into something that I don't know was like a big weird mix of win and loss. It's timeless. I'm very oh, curious God. what it was like going through that renewal and cancellation process cuz usually it's a pretty cut and dry like damn, we got canceled and now I'm sad or yay, we got renewed and we're moving forward, but that feels like one big weird mixture of both emotions at the same time. I know, it was so bittersweet. Um <sighs> It honestly just felt like <laughs> like you were in a relationship with someone that you really loved and then you took a break and then you got back into the relationship and then you took a break and then you got back into the relationship. <laughs> just like an emotional roller coaster. But honestly, the thing I hold on to the most is just the power of the fans. Like that was really just the most beautiful thing because the, that show had such such dedicated, amazing fans and they brought it back to life twice. And that was just, I mean, it was sad that we couldn't keep continue that journey, but we enjoyed every second of it. The, the, it it made you really, it made us really grateful to, you know, be able to get to tell out, tell that story just like a little bit longer and then just a little bit longer. And, and, um, I mean, it was sad that it got canceled, but I'm, I'm, I still, I see Malcolm all the time. <laughs> I see Malcolm all the time. I see so many people from that show and we're all still in contact and it's actually just so beautiful because so many friendships came out of that and we had such an amazing time. So it's a special thing when a show does well enough to get renewed, but I th- I really do believe it's an extra special thing when your show sparks such a dedicated and intense fan base that they fight for it like that. And yes. that doesn't happen nearly as often as straightforward renewals. So that really is special. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. All right. Before we jump into the boys, okay. I wanted to squeeze in one Call of Duty question. Let's do because it. I am, I am curious. How exactly does one, I don't know if pivot's the right word, or like add another opportunity to their lineup of things in addition to television and film acting and get into what it takes to play a character in a game like Call of Duty? I mean, that audition, uh, I had no idea um, or, or I think even like any innate desire at the time to, to be in a video game. I remembered, um, you know, I was like, I want to be in TV. I want to be in film. I want to be in theater. I, I, I was so disconnected from the world of video games that I, I was really clueless going into that audition. And I thought it was just going to be in a, like a, a room like this, just a regular room, like with a casting, uh, um, someone in casting and a, and a camera and just in me in a room. I, and I walked into this huge warehouse <laughs> with like 15 people and a table of, uh, a, and a table um, full of like fake AR-15s and, and grenades and, and all of these weapons and like eight cameras set up in the space. And it was this huge sprawling space. And I remember thinking at the time, I was like, oh, okay, it's it's all or nothing. Oh, you, you have to like, you have to, we're going in, we're going in. And um, 
it has been one of my most favorite projects that I have ever done. And I am so happy that I got to play this amazing character. And I, I'm, I'm like, I'm speechless. I'm not even, I'm not even <laughs> forming proper sentences here because it, I just, I'm, it's really unfathomable how much I really just love that project and love every single person working on it and love the world and love the character of Farah. It was something that definitely like smack bang hit me out of nowhere. And, uh, and I loved every damn second of it. It's essentially like you're a bunch of theater kids. You're, you, it's like you're in theater. It's, I feel like I'm on a stage. It has that grand, grandiose energy. Like it has the grandiosity of that. It has, it has that energy and, uh, oh my God, what was your question about it, Perry? I don't even remember. I just, I'm so excited. I just love it so much. I'm so excited about it. Any, any time I got to go into that studio was just magic. I mean, I think you kind of answered. I don't even remember what my full for fully formed question was at the beginning. So that must mean your answer was so enthralling that it turned oh, my sorry. brain to mush. You, I do I do have a good follow-up though. Right. So <laughs> that is a very different way of using your craft to film something like that. So is there anything about that production process that, you know, made you find a new tool in your acting toolkit, so to speak, that you're now able to apply on more traditional film and television work? Voice is everything voice is one of the greatest tools you have at your disposal as an actor. Um, Cause it has such power. It, it can command a room. It can entice a listener. It can, it can, it can really change a scene. Uh, so that was the biggest thing I learned. Um, also, I, I have like some, some, uh, some, <laughs> half-baked knowledge about how to enter a room based on the threat level so <laughs> that's great <laughs> because they have they have uh, consultants coming in they have you know to train you and to show you how to hold a gun how to enter a room how like what you would your character would do in this particular situation um with this threat on coming here like how you would attack them how you would shoot from this angle it's it's very uh technical um and it's also very technical in regards to the, the the technology that they use. You know, you're in a mocap suit, you've got all the dots on you and everything, and you've got the helmet on with the camera right in front of your face. So it was also very interesting to, to act out scenes that seem to be more intimate or more close, like the characters are right here having this conversation. But really, they're like, that. you're doing like the six feet apart rule, and you're having this very close, intimate conversation with a person. So, um, Yeah. A new, new, new spin on intimacy, uh, voices everything, and I can kind of go to war. No, I can't. No, I can't. No, I can't. It's uh, I would be useless. I would be absolutely useless because those guys are the. <laughs> it's a whole nother set of um, skills. I went down the rabbit hole of watching a lot of behind the scenes material on that. And I mean, literally every single element of that production is kind of mind blowing in how far yeah. they actually pushed it. I'm very impressed by that. Yeah. Please note that I said I can go to war very sarcastically in this interview. Please note that I said that because I have nothing but the utmost respect for those people because they it's it's it, it's insane. It's it's out of this world what they oh, do absolutely yeah all right let's jump into the boys i wanted to start at the beginning with that one because i am curious what is the biggest difference between your expectations for the role of victoria when you first booked it compared to the journey she's gone on thus far oh i was absolutely in the dark about victoria newman <laughs> in regards to her superpowers i i booked the job and i thought she was this you know progressive democrat i thought she was this this, this politician coming in hell bent on taking down this evil corporation so driven and so pure and then i got the script for episode seven <laughs> um of season two and that's when uh we're in the hearing and she starts popping everyone's heads did you not know anything about her ability or her relationship with stan edgar prior to filming those scenes then oh okay no season three we got a we got a bit of a heads up because it was okay. um you know it was the pandemic so they actually got the scripts to us they had a lot of time to get those scripts out to us so um i got the bulk of the season 
before we went and shot it this time around. <laughs> so wait, going back to season two then, when you're doing those newscast videos, I was revisiting some of it and there's a part where you reference your father. So at the time, like, were you wondering like, like, who is my father? Yeah. Or was that just kind of a line in the bit? <laughs> I was like, they'll cover this later, I'm sure. I'm sure my father was like this great man who like worked his job every day and like really is working for the little people. Not none of that. None of that. Oh boy. None of that. Oh was boy. Great. That's, that's such a fascinating process that you have to go on when you're working with some, yeah. some material like this. Actually, speaking of that source material, did they ever even mention Victor? Like I know Victor Newman is completely different from yeah. the Victoria Newman we see in the show, but did they ever even mention that character to you? Yes. Well, they just, well, they said like, this is what the inspiration of the character is and we're completely changing it. <laughs> that was basically it. They were like, this is what the, this is what the character is in the comic books. And, um, and Victoria Newman is is the complete opposite of of uh, Vic the Beat. So, okay, I have so many questions about digging into her whole mentality through this journey. But first, I want to know a little bit about working with the ensemble here because, you know, you're basically stepping onto the set of a hugely popular show where the entire ensemble has established a rhythm for a whole season. So. Day one, when you hit that set, is there anyone in particular in that cast that you you could kind of turn to as a safe haven, I guess, someone who made you feel super comfortable and kind of showed you the way in terms of how everything operated? Jack Wade. He was, I, I remember coming in, it was one of my first days and I was sitting in the makeup trailer and I was I like, you know, and the actors come in and they say hi and they introduce themselves to you. And, um... And I remember Jack came in and he had such, there's such like, such a welcoming energy, such a nice energy about him. And he was, he was really wonderful. And he just started cracking jokes. And I remember being like, oh, thank God. My, my, like, <laughs> like <laughs> my safety, my, my safe area, humor. <laughs> Cause it's such an intense show. But, um, but I remember that was very much, that was a moment that I got put at ease when I first stepped onto the set was he was just like, it was just cracking jokes and it was just a very, it just felt like a very lighthearted uh, kind of uh, energy for the, for, for such a, a sh an intense show. And I, and I, and then it was a breeze from there, honestly, every other interaction I had, he was just my first interaction really. But um, every other interaction I had from that point on was just absolute bliss. Like every single person on that show is, so much fun to work with and we all hang out outside of work as much as as we do on set honestly i think i see some some uh of the actors outside of set more than i see them on set because it's such a sprawling show that like some characters never meet um which is so funny no it's such a close-knit group they they welcomed me in with open arms like right off the bat there's such a genuine cast there's such a funny bunch of people it's it was i I felt um, it was very daunting to come into that show because you're right; it's such a huge show, and it's and it's and it's so good, and so you want to be good too because every single person on that show is incredible. Um, but all of those fears just melted away the second I, I I stepped on that set because everyone's just so welcoming. I love hearing that. I feel like you oh can my feel like the behind the scenes vibe radiating. Off. I, like I'm a big believer that that actually happens. And I think this show is a perfect example of that. Look, some of us play such assholes on this show, but it is just, it's just a testament to how it, like the caliber of talent because everyone's just so wonderful. I cannot say a bad thing about anyone. I can't. All right, before we dig into season three, I did want to ask you one question about the, the Congress head popping set piece, because so like it's a big set piece with lots of blood and it looks really cool and all that stuff. But to me, it also feels like a masterclass in delivering reaction shots, because your reaction to everything that happens is of the utmost importance. So what was it like for you finding that pitch perfect blend between her being the person behind all of it, but her also having to convince everyone in that room that she has nothing to do with it and is genuinely terrified. Well, there are two elements here. Two things happened. So first of all, <laughs> you just kind of have to not anticipate it. I remember that day I came to set and they just, they, they put, they placed this gun below me, like below the desk f filled with fake blood. And I remember the director saying, uh, he was like, all right, we have one shot at this. So, uh, 
don't anticipate it. <laughs> so like, so I just had to not anticipate it because we had only one shot at having like, otherwise I would have had to go to makeup again, redo it. So it's, it's literally just a one and done. So you have to really just like tell every part of your being not to react to the thing that it wants to react to. Um, it's almost like someone saying to you, I'm going to punch you in the face. D just don't flinch. Don't flinch. Um, but it worked out. Thank God it worked out. And then the second thing was on that day, we actually filmed a few versions of Newman's reactions to the, to the splatter happening in the room. We shot, you know, we shot the one that they used, which is, you know, she's shocked and she doesn't know anything's happening and what's happening. Who is it? Who could it be? <laughs> and then we, we did a take where, uh, she was far more measured in her, uh, reactions and actual act actively looking at the people that she was exploding the heads of. So they, it, it really just happened in the edit. I guess they just, they see which way they want it to go and they get a, 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 diff a couple of different colors for the scene and, and choose some, the, the thing that works the best. Where you and where you ended up is quite good. It was good. Respect. It was good. <laughs> Very impressed. Do you, do you like the nickname the head popper? Or if you could give her a, a soup name of your choice, what would you choose? I can't think of one because I only think of the head popper. Um, no, I think head popper is it. I think that's you. It's it's what the people came up with. So it's head popper. I mean, most of the names are pretty on the nose, so I feel like that fits the show quite well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Digging into season three a little, uh, one particular scene that I wanted to touch on was the Tony kill in episode one, Tony. particularly because that is a really intense and emotional beat for both you and the actor playing Tony. But in this case, you're the series regular and he's there on set for, I don't know, maybe a single day or for one scene at least. And he has to be there at an 11 the entire time. So as the series regular, is there anything you strive to do to support someone who is just coming in for that, sh that short stretch? Oh, you just make, you just, make, because, well, because I've been on both sides of it. I've been on like the guest star coming in or like someone coming into the operation and, and you're endlessly scared because you just think like they all know what they're doing and, and I'm not a part of it. And you're kind you're like the new kid at camp or like that, you know, um, it's like your first day of school and everyone knows each other already from the previous year. Um, uh, honestly, you, you just, you just make that person feel as welcome as possible. You just, you just like, you're just a human being, at, um, in any circumstance where someone new is coming in and, and, um, you, uh, Kyle and I actually though, no, what am I saying? This isn't specific to Kyle who played Tony. But in general, you just you just you you you're welcoming. You uh, make sure that person's having a great day. If they have any questions, you help them out. You just make sure you're you're there, um, uh, and assisting in any way possible. Um, uh, if they want to run lines, you run lines. If they want, like I'm just I'm just always uh, I just want to cater to to make sure their experience is is great and they have a great time on the show. And it's easy with this show because it is a great show and everyone does have a great time. But. Kyle and I actually got to know each other for like six weeks prior to that scene because we had to do fight choreography. That makes sense. So we met up, we would meet, and we had to like, I mean, like we're like tussling on the ground and we're like, so you get to know each other fast. You have to, um, and you have to trust that person because you're doing some uh, intense uh, physical work. Um, and so you have to have that, that, that trust in your partner in in a scene like that in a moment like that so kyle and i got to know each other very well it was actually a, a breeze we we were itching to do to shoot that scene because we've been prepping for it for six weeks it is a, a very very powerful scene yeah. and one that manages to convey a significant amount of history even though that was the first time we ever saw him yes. I love it. It was good. All right, let's jump to the press conference in episode four when she turns on Stan. Right. That when when been. you're when you're playing that beat and giving that speech, and I guess also walking up to the podium, in your head, is there any wavering on her part whatsoever at that point? Or does she know when she's going up there and delivering that speech with absolute certainty that her decision is to support Homelander? Oh, no, she's she's going through an incredible internal conflict this entire season. So every de and every decision that she makes, she makes two pretty big ones that are that are ultimate betrayals of those closest to her. 
and she's fully aware of that. Um, and to go against someone like Stan Edgar for any person would be a terrifying moment. And for Newman, you have the, the, <laughs> the added aspect of him being a father figure to her and the person who's been there for her her entire life. So she's definitely on edge and I'm, sh I, I mean, I, I, I played it. I don't know if it, it came through, but I, there was, you know, she's hesitating with what she's about to say. Does she say it? Does she not? So there's definitely a moment of, this is my decision. There's definitely a moment of decision there on that stage. Oh, I, the reason I asked that question is because it comes on through the, quite well. You, you, basically exude, yeah. you basically exude a very complicated headspace and my brain can't compute the math of how do you represent so many different struggles and emotions in one particular beat. That's it's Well, it was actually amazing this season because I got to really dive into like the nuance of her vulnerability or like who she is behind all the mar like behind the masks that she wears on a in the public eye on a daily basis with every interaction she has so it was actually so much fun to to find out like how does she actually act how does she actually react to a situation because she has so many Situ she has so many like interactions where she's kind of feigning a reaction to something or she's putting on it like she's just acting she's an actor <laughs> um but you know, you get a few really raw moments with Newman where you get to see who, what woman she actually is. It's qualities that keep me leaning in and wanting to know more. This next question is more of a theory question for you, but given everything she goes through this season, I am curious to know what you think about this. What is something about the way that Stan raised, raised her, raised Nadia, I guess, that you'll want, you think that the character is going to want to do for her own daughter, but then to flip that around, what is something that you you think she's going to strive to do completely differently than how Stan handled things? I mean, I think she's going down the route more so of Stan Edgar than, than, than her own path right now. Uh, oh gosh, what a question. Um, I think her ultimate motivation and desire and want is uh, to protect her daughter at all costs. And I think initially that, that protection was from even just like the world of, of superpowers and, and superheroes and, um, and everything that comes with that. So I think she probably initially did want her daughter to just have like a regular childhood and just grow up and have a regular job and just, you know, I, I, and I think Newman is also desperately someone who wants that for herself. She, she, she has the house, she has the daughter, she has the, you know, but, um, ugh. but this season it, it, you know, it, it, it goes over into that other, um, world, which is very much, <sighs> God, Perry, I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know what Newman will do. I think right now she's actually stuck between a rock and a hard place and she made a decision out of desperation. So I don't actually think she has a hold of what her daughter's future looks like or what she plans for, for how to, to, to raise her really from this point on. I think she had a plan up until this point, but I think everything changes once she injects her daughter with compound V. I mean... It changed her life entirely. She killed her parents because of it. So, yeah, I think I think she's she's giving her daughter some some incredible trauma, and she knows that very completely, fully well. I'll end with one question that probably won't be any easier, but I think you kind of have hinted at this just a little bit. So, Mary, did you see me struggle through that last question? <laughs> I I did. I did. I know. Let's do it. Bring it. I, Let's do it. I know, I know you probably don't know all that much about what lies ahead, but like digging into how you play moments now could at least, yeah, I don't know, yeah, give us yeah, something yeah. to think about in between seasons as we're desperately waiting more. But so at the end of this season, do you think that there's any there's any hope for her? Because she's obviously she's got a habit of, you know, being pretty ruthless and doing yeah. what she needs for her and her daughter to survive. But 
she is fighting for some good things. It's just that she's going about it in all the wrong ways. And a lot of characters on this show have done that and have realized the error of their ways. Yeah. So at this point, just from playing her through seasons two and three, do you feel that that's in there deep down somewhere for her as well? I think there is. I think there is hope for Newman. Um <laughs> I'm imagining us cutting to like season four and she's just completely <laughs> gone dark. Um, look, I'm, I'm imagining there is hope for Newman because throughout this season, you definitely see her struggle with the decisions that she makes. She doesn't make them effortlessly. These are, these are huge sacrifices that uh, will have consequences. And she's fully aware of that. She understands that no matter how morally gray the decision is that she makes. So she has a, uh, a, uh, a measure a, a good like measurement of what is good and what is bad she's not clueless to that she's not completely lost whether or not she actually goes through with that or you know has a redemption of sorts i'm not sure that we will get that because on a show like the boys i mean every character's introduction and like and progress is is kind of like a a baptism of fire like every character is like has a moment where they're essentially going through the gauntlet, and I think Newman's right at the beginning of that. She's she's making some some decisions that will put her in some pretty dark places. I mean, she's she's made a deal with Homelander, so I don't think we're we're on the way up. I think we're on the way down. <laughs> been one of the most fascinating character arcs to track in a show that is absolutely filled with curious character development. So that is one heck of an accomplishment there. You're too easy to talk to. We've gone on for too I'm long. So sorry. I have to let you know. No, I, I love this so much. I appreciate your insight and huge congratulations on the boys, but also everything else you've accomplished and everything else you've got coming up. I know you've got a film you're producing around the corner Thanks too, so much, and I'm Mary. excited to see what you do behind the lens. So Thank you and congratulations. Cheers. Thank you so much. This was an absolute pleasure. I could have kept talking forever with you.